Many magic sets have a gimmick related to one specific card type. For example, Mirrodin sets are always about artifacts, and Theros sets are focused on enchantments. But one set took one of these card type themes to the extreme. Legions, which was released in 2003. All 145 cards in Legions are creatures. It was the second set in Onslaught block, a block that was focused on creatures in the first place since it was all about creature types. But the other two sets in Onslaught block do have cards that aren't creatures, but that's not the case for Legions. In this video, we'll take a look at the 10 cards in Legions that have left the biggest impact on competitive magic. This video is sponsored by Card Kingdom. Use the links in the description to visit their store. Before we get started, here's a quick reminder on how I rank cards in these videos. I use a scoring system where cards are awarded two points for first tier top eights, like Pro Tours, and one point for second tier top eights, like Regional Championships. At number 10, it's Hunter Sliver. Slivers are one of the many supported creature types in Onslaught Block, and it makes sense to include them, as almost every sliver has an ability that benefits other slivers. This one costs one generic and a red, and it gives all of your slivers Provoke. Provoke makes it so that when your creature attacks, you can choose to have target creature defending player controls untap and block it if able. In other words, a Provoke creature forces an opposing creature to block, and it can even force a creature to untap to do it. This mechanic was introduced in Legions, and it was pretty important. After all, the set doesn't have any non-creatures, so when it came to the limited format, this meant there was very little removal since you only had one pack of Onslaught and two packs of Legions. Provoke made it so that creatures could work as removal. Giving this ability to Slivers is pretty awesome too because they are often quite large and sport all kinds of keywords. Unsurprisingly, the Sliver has gained all of its points in Sliver decks. All of those top eights have come in Popper, a format where only commons are legal. Sliver decks do quite well in the format because there are lots of awesome common slivers, like Hunter Sliver. It's likely to put up more top eights in Popper in the future. At number 9, it's Nantuko Vigilante. For 3 generic and a green, it's a 3-2, and it has more for 1 generic and a green. This means you can play it face down for 3 generic as a 2-2, and it can turn face up at any time for its morph cost, and when the Vigilante is turned face up, you destroy an artifact or enchantment. Onslaught introduced the morph mechanic, and like Provoke, it was one way to design creatures that could do interactive stuff, even at instant speed. Nantuko Vigilante put up top eights in both block and standard, where it was a sideboard card in a variety of decks. Both formats featured decks that used powerful cards that the Vigilante could destroy, like Astral Slide and Opposition. The Vigilante hasn't put up any top eights since rotating out of standard. At number eight, it's Graveborn Muse. Legions features a whole cycle of muses, with Seedborn Muse and Windborn Muse probably more famous these days thanks to Commander, but Graveborn Muse is no slouch either, and it's the only one in the cycle to make the list. For two generic and two black, it's a 3-3, and at the beginning of your upkeep, you draw X cards and lose X life, where X is the number of zombies you control. The Muse itself is a zombie, so at a minimum, X will be one. It was played in mono black decks in Standard. In that deck, the Muse almost felt like Necropotence. These decks ran lots of zombies, so the Muse could draw lots of cards, and you could mitigate all that life loss with Corrupt, a sorcery that gains you a ton of life while doing tons of damage. After finding success in Standard in 2003, the Muse also got another Standard Legal reprint in 2007 in 10th edition, and it made the most of that by appearing once again in mono black decks, this time alongside Tendrils of Corruption and Consumed Spirit. However, after rotating out of standard a second time, the Muse hasn't put up any more top eights. At number seven, it's Willbender, another morph creature. This one costs one generic and a blue for a one, two, and you can turn it face up for one generic and a blue. And when it gets turned face up, it changes the target of target spell or ability with a single target. Redirecting spells is pretty spicy, as pointing your opponent's own removal at their own creatures is a big swing, since now you don't lose a creature, your opponent does. Willbender didn't actually see any play as a result of its original printing in Legions, but it's another card that got a Time Spiral Time Shifted reprint in 2007, and this time around it saw significant play in both Block and Standard. Time Spiral Block and Time Spiral Standard heavily featured morph decks with Vesuvian Shapeshifter, a morph clone that could even copy the turn face up abilities of morphs. So if you had a Willbender in play face up and turn the Shapeshifter face up, you could copy the Willbender and redirect his spell, and then you could turn the Shapeshifter face down again while threatening to turn it face up on a future turn. That deck's main win condition was a lock with Brine Elemental, but being able to Willbender every single turn was also pretty great. 
Will Bender hasn't put up any top eight since rotating out of standard that second time, though. At number six, it's Glow Rider. For two generic and a white, it's a 2-1, and it makes non-creature spells cost one generic more to cast. Tax effects are pretty sweet, especially if you can make them asymmetrical, and you can certainly do that here by not playing any or at least very few non-creatures, and there are some opponents who really can't overcome attacks like this. It didn't see any play for the first decade and a half of its existence, and eventually it was overshadowed by Thalia, Guardian of Thraben, a cheaper creature with the same stat line plus first strike and the same ability. However, between 2018 and 2021, Glowrider saw regular play in Magic's most powerful format, Vintage. Glowrider's tax is at its most potent in that format, since most decks run lots and lots of non-creatures, like the Power 9, and it even makes otherwise free spells like Force of Will cost mana. Glowrider was played in that format's Eldrazi decks, which are aggro decks that power out Eldrazi with fast mana and don't run very many non-creature spells. These decks also used Thalia Guardian of Thraben, and Glowrider made it so that the deck could more consistently get one of these tax effects online. However, Glowrider hasn't put up a top 8 in any format since 2021. At number 5, it's Wirewood Hive Master. For one generic and a green, it's a 1 1, and whenever another non token elf enters, you create a 1 1 green insect creature token. It's pretty sweet to get that extra token every time you have a non token elf enter. It won't surprise you that all of its points have come in elf decks and extended in Legacy, and in particular in Glimpse of Nature elf decks which look to cast the glimpse and play a bunch of elves that produce mana, like Heritage Druid. This lets you rip through your entire deck in a single turn because you keep drawing more elves, it can produce more mana, which lets you cast more elves, which draws you more cards. And if the Hive Master is in play, you're also putting lots of insect tokens in play. The deck would eventually win the game by grabbing a Predator Dragon or Crater Hoof Behemoth, which would immediately make the board lethal. While Glimpse Elf decks are still a thing, the Hive Master hasn't been a part of them since 2010. At number 4, it's a Chroma Angel of Wrath. For 5 generic and 3 white, she's a 6-6 with flying, first strike, vigilance, trample, haste, and protection from black and red. When she made her debut in Legions, she quickly took on the mantle of strongest creature in the game. She's hard to interact with in combat because of all those keywords, she puts your opponent on a fast clock thanks to haste, and she has protection from two colors that make it hard to remove her with spells. As a result, she became the premier creature to get into play ahead of schedule in multiple formats, Think of her as the Atraxa Grand Unifier of her time. In block, she was played in ramp decks. In standard, the first time around, she was cheated into play with Tooth and Nail. She also got a time-shifted reprint, like some of the other cards on this list, and in her second run through standard, she would be discarded and copied by Body Double, and in extended and legacy, she was reanimated. However, her reign as the strongest creature in the game took a hit first with the printing of artifact creatures like Dark Steel Colossus and Sphinx of the Steel Wind, which could also be cheated into play with Tinker, unlike her, and after the introduction of Eldrazi in 2010, it was clear that her time as the strongest creature in the game was long over. At number 3, it's Click Slither. For one generic and three red, it's a 3-3 three three with haste, and you can sacrifice a goblin to give it plus 2, plus 2, and trample until end of turn. So if you've got a lot of goblins in play, you can swing for lethal out of nowhere with a huge insect. And of course, the Click Slither was played in exactly that kind of deck in both block and standard. It was particularly good alongside Goblin Sharpshooter, a goblin that can tap to ping and untaps any time a creature dies. So every goblin you sacrifice to Click Slither also lets you ping your opponent. However, Click Slither hasn't put up any top eights in any format since 2004. At number two, it's Withered Wretch. For two black mana, it's a 2-2, and you can pay one generic to exile a card from a graveyard. This doesn't look particularly exciting to us today, but it was one of the best ways to hate on graveyards when it got printed, especially if you were a creature deck that didn't want to run cards dedicated solely to hating on the graveyard. With the Wretch, you had a solid two drop that you could main deck and it could hate on the graveyard when that's what you needed. This made it useful in zombie decks, of course, but lots of black decks in many formats used the Wretch too. Basically, it was the scavenging ooze of its day, but it hasn't top aided anything since 2008. And at number one, it's Gem Palm Incinerator. For two generic and a red, it's a 2-1, and it has cycling for one generic and a red, which means you can pay that cost and discard it from your hand to draw a card, and when you cycle it, it does X damage to target creature, where X is the number of goblins on the battlefield. So, it's not so good to cast the Incinerator normally, but in a goblin deck, it's a two-mana removal spell that can kill most things and draw you a card, which is excellent. And it's even better than that, because cycling the Incinerator isn't casting a spell, so your opponent's options for countering it are severely limited. 
It should come as no surprise then that it's been played in Goblin decks in every single format it's ever been legal in. Those decks can usually tutor it up too using Goblin Matron, and once she can search up the best removal spell in your deck as well as any of your other goblins, she gets really good too. Jim Palm Incinerator is still putting up points and it has a massive lead on the rest of the list. I think it's probably going to remain the number one Legions card forever. So those are the top 10 cards from Legions. If you want to get your hands on any of these creatures, check out the description or you can find a direct Card Kingdom link for each card that appeared in the video. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others can enjoy it too. If you want to make sure you catch future videos, don't forget to subscribe. And if you want to watch past videos, including many more that look at specific sets, you should see a playlist on your screen shortly. Thanks for watching.